So, it is early March 2020, and it's a few minutes before our weekly AMA is due to start at Coinbase. And normally, this would put us in a big conference room, bigger than this, with our whole San Francisco team broadcasting all of the questions from our employees, as well as all the company updates out to the world. But today, it's just me and Emily and Brian alone in a tiny conference room because a week ago we had sent everybody home, optionally, to work from home. Kind of a surprise. And a week earlier, our, at the last AMA that we'd had in person, our chief people officer had cracked a joke that it was the last one we'd ever have in person. And it was starting to look like he was right. And I was sitting there scrolling through our employee questions, many of which were about what it would mean for us as a company if COVID continued to spread. And we did not have a lot of good answers other than sending people home to work. But over the next three years, we would learn a ton of lessons about how to be a remote company, how to scale culture, reinforce culture, clarify culture in hyper growth. And that's what I'm gonna talk about today. So hello, I'm Daisy Linden. I lead employee experience at Coinbase. I have been with the company for five years, seen it scale from 350 to 3,500 people, seen us go public, seen us go remote, and weather more than one crypto winter. So today I'm gonna focus on a couple things related to culture. So what culture is and why it matters, I'm gonna talk about lessons we've learned at Coinbase from our journey around culture and remote first. I'm gonna talk about where we haven't gotten it right, where we've actually stumbled with respect to culture and in how that has helped us learn those lessons. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about how you can get started with this work at the stage you're at today. So to get started, let's talk briefly about why culture matters. So I want to acknowledge that um, defining culture at a small company of 350 people is very different from doing that work at a company of three or even 30. And I suspect it feels pretty low on the list of things you all have to think about as founders and founding teams. But unless being a founder is your very first job ever, I suspect that you had an experience with culture at your prior company or companies and that that culture actually impacted how easy or hard it was to get your job done. So, I mean, just thinking about it pragmatically, like, was there something that was super hard to do at your last company because the culture made it hard? Or something that was easy or made easier because the culture reinforced that way of working? A very long way of saying, culture matters, and even though it can feel like soft stuff, it has a direct impact on everything else about what it feels like to work at your company. So that's true everywhere in every industry, but I would argue that it is especially true in crypto because no one knows better than the people in this room that this industry is still young and whether we're talking about policy updates or protocol changes or anything else, there's a lot of uncertainty out in the world and not a lot of that is within your control as founders or founding teams. What is within your control is the experience that your employees have inside your company and you can create the confidence that the market's not gonna create for them by defining what the culture is, how they should show up, how they can be successful. You can help them navigate the roller coaster of everything that crypto and blockchain is in ways that you know, is, is harder to do for you than a, an industry that is more established. And that's true at Coinbase. Brian is very fond of reminding all of us all the time that it's never as good as it seems and it's never as bad as it seems. And I think maybe the first example I experienced of this at Coinbase was in summer 2019, Bitcoin broke $10,000 for the first time in over a year. And crypto Twitter was going nuts and obviously a lot of chatter inside the company. And Brian popped on Coinbase Slack and was basically like, grab a beer, give your partner a high five, celebrate for a couple minutes, but then we're going back to work because we don't over rotate on crypto prices. We don't over rotate on hype. And that has helped us build a company that is able to weather the ups and downs of crypto in a way that keeps people more confident and more calm in all of the moments where things could be hard. So a culture that values that long view was something that was really important to us, and it's something that you can use as a lever also. So before I go any further, culture has like a thousand definitions, so I actually wanna talk about what I mean when I say culture. So TLDR, culture is the how which includes things like language. So what are the literal words that you're using to talk when you talk to your team? Um, what are the terms? What is sort of like the internal jargon, inside jokes? What's the lore? What are the, what are the stories from your founding that you tell over and over and over again that help define 
the history of the company you're creating right now? What are the behaviors? What are the ways that you just expect people to show up in the sort of casual everyday moments, in a meeting, in the hallway, in a hallway, at an offsite? What are the rituals? What are the ways you start your day? The ways you finish a project? The, um, the things that you do when you're, whenever you're together? Maybe you always go bowling. And the standard practices. So what are the steps of work that you're engaged in in ways that you're sort of defining standard operating procedures for your company? And so when you look at these things, it's actually easy to see that everyone in the company can impact culture. Everyone can either reinforce or undermine these things that you're creating. But there are some groups that have an especial influence on culture. So I want to talk about those briefly. You've got tenured employees, so that might mean a couple of months at this point for some of you, but the people who have been with your company the longest are going to be the ones who are reinforcing the ways that you work, the ways that you show up, and that new employees are going to look to to see signals for how they should show up to. Uh, teams who are at the center of the business. So as product-driven companies, a lot of this for you will be eng teams, product teams, people who are really driving the progress forward at the company have an outsized impact on the culture with their preferences and the ways that they work. When you get to this, admins and EAs have a huge impact on the culture because they hold the keys to everyone's schedules and they can impact who meets with whom, when, how often, and what those meetings look like. And then finally, I'm talking to you today because no one has a bigger impact on culture than founders and founding teams. And you can see the direct influence if you look at any founder-led company. Um, when, you, when you think about Coinbase, we have a self-professed introvert as a founder. And we've built a culture that is super friendly to introverts. We have a culture that focuses on written feedback over discussion. We have a culture where interruption is unacceptable in meetings. And that's directly because of the influence of Brian, our founder. So all of these other groups listed here and everyone else at your company is going to look to you as the founder to set the standard for what the culture is. And that's your responsibility and your privilege as a founder to figure out what you want that to be. So now that I've done all of that sort of definitional work, what have we learned at Coinbase about culture over the last five years? So there are five big lessons for us that I think we've, we've uncovered. Um, all of these, better late than never, you can do them anytime, but order does matter, and so I'm going to start with the things that are most important for you to start with first, and I'm going to work my way towards things that are maybe a little bit more useful a little further on in your arc of growth. So I'm going to start with the one thing that you need to do before anything else when you think about culture, and that is write it down. So a source of truth for what you want your culture to be is vital, especially in a remote first or a hybrid company where people aren't picking that up organically from one another. So our story here at Coinbase, um, when we were 500 people, we started the work of defining our culture doc. And 500 people is late. Uh, we started because we were starting to feel cultural drift. We were starting to feel the culture pull away from what we had intended for it to be. But starting this work early can really benefit you for a couple of reasons. It clarifies your thinking. So if you try to write something down, you will understand better what you think about it. It will uncover misalignment you might have with other members of your founding team. So maybe you think that feedback should be, should be delivered in public. Maybe your co-founder thinks it should only be delivered in private. Better to discover those things on the front end than when you're in the trenches together. You can use whatever you write down as a bat signal to the people you are trying to seek to join your team. If you have a crisp understanding of the culture you're trying to create, you can signal that to the candidates you're talking to to entice them to join your team. Transparent people are going to look for transparent cultures. And it influences the early kind of feedback you might give people who are already on your team. So if you know what your culture, if you know what you want your culture to be, you can use that as sort of an anchor when you think about the feedback that you're giving to the people around you to help them more closely align to it. So again, to get started, start with a blank Google Doc. Write down how you want your company to work, some of those rituals, those norms, those uh, stories that you want to define the culture you're creating. Don't worry about getting it right. You will promise you will update it, you will change it, you will evolve it. Um, the lesson here is just get started. So next, once you have written something down, it's time to change it. Be flexible. Um, changing your mind and changing your culture is a good thing as long as you're doing it grounded in data. So the Coinbase story on this front, um, we had a big change that hit us really early in COVID. A few years before 2020, we had actually made the decision that 
the only and best way to be maximally productive as a company was actually to have everyone on site together. So we had had a handful of people scattered around the country. We had actually brought them into our offices because we believed that that was the best way to do the best work, was having everyone in the same place. And of course, COVID totally undid that. We were all doing this remote work, work from home experiment all of a sudden, all at once. And after a few months, we found that it was actually working, that we did not feel less productive than we had when we were in the office. And we were open to that lesson. We were open to that learning. And we actually changed our policy. We decided to be a remote first company forever a couple of months into COVID. And so being flexible in the face of that lesson allowed us to distinguish ourselves as an employer. It allowed us to draw talent from all of the world that we would not have been able to hire if we were forcing everyone to come into the office every day. So when you think about the culture that you're trying to create, it's OK that it, it's not static. It shouldn't be. Your company's going to grow. Your culture can grow with it. But remember to be clear about that. And when you think about how you want to capture that, consider adding a change log to your culture doc or however you're recording thoughts around your culture and actually recording what changed and why about what you want your culture to be. Having that always on continuous source of truth will ensure that you actually use this thing and it's not a doc that just dies off in a Google Drive somewhere. So as you hone your sense of what you want your culture to be and maybe evolve it over time, it's really important to communicate it to your people. So especially when you're starting out, communicating early with maybe not even the full story is actually more important than waiting to have everything buttoned up in a neat little package before com communicating it to your employees. So we went remote in March of 2020, like I said, a, uh, because of everyone working from home. And we decided we were going to be remote first forever in May 2020, like three months later. And when we communicated that, we had almost no answers about what that would actually mean for employees. We knew we had the decision. We knew we were committed to it. But there was a lot we didn't know. And we communicated that to employees, too. Because there was so much that was uncertain in that moment, we decided it was more important to create the clarity we could for employees, even if not everything was clear, than wait until we had that complete story package up. And I mean, compare that to some companies 18 months into COVID who still didn't know what their remote work policy was, with now employees all over the country who were just keeping their fingers crossed they weren't going to get called back into the office at some point. So when you communicate clearly in the good times for the positive messages, that kind of earns you the ability to be equally transparent with the tough messages. And when you can sort of train your team, train your company to be used to that, again, that's one of those things that can sort of smooth out the peaks and valleys of crypto, make it easier for everyone to live with. So as an example, we've since evolved our remote first policy. We have said some, some roles need to be in office. And we communicated that clearly. And even though it wasn't like the greatest message to deliver, some people weren't super happy about it, we were able to deliver it clearly and employees appreciated that clarity even if it wasn't the message they necessarily wanted to hear. So develop the habit of communicating sooner rather than later. And even if employees don't love the message, they will appreciate the clarity that you bring to it um, sooner versus later. So, so far we've talked a lot about words. Now we're gonna talk about actions. So lesson four is for the culture you now have on paper to actually be the culture of your company, you need to integrate that, those words, those ideas into the systems of your company. So we've done this at Coinbase by reshaping the hiring process with our culture in mind. We've created a pre-hiring manager screen assessment that is intended to see how well someone's going to fit with our culture, how successful they will be as part of our culture. And this is related to an earlier point I made about culture as a bat signal. So you want to transmit what that culture is to people out in the world so the right people can be attracted to your company. If you don't do that, if you don't demonstrate what you want your culture to be, no one's going to know. And you're not, you're not doing any of that filtering on the front end, and you have to do it all in your recruiting process. So you know, a Google Doc with thoughts on what your culture should be that you don't share with your recruiter or that they're not using to have their conversations doesn't actually do you any good in that part of the employee life cycle. So when you think about your employee user journey, so things like hiring, onboarding, reviews, promotions, think about how you can inject culture into each of those steps. So you know, for example, reviewing someone's performance based on pieces of the culture that you think are important for them to demonstrate. 
So the last lesson is the toughest, uh, and hopefully you have some practice with culture work before you have to get here. But it's to realign your culture when you need it to. So when your culture is moving away from the one that you want, it's again your responsibility as a founder, founding team, leadership team, to realign it with what you want it to be. So back in 2018, our mission statement at Coinbase was to build an open financial system for the world. That was and is true, but as hiring accelerated, as we started moving into hypergrowth, a lot of people who joined the company interpreted that message differently from what we meant. They assumed, based on those words, that we were gonna start in developing markets, that we were gonna go intervene around the world in places where fiat currency was broken. And that's never been our strategy. And we had a bunch of people now who wanted it to be our strategy, or thought it was when they joined. So we did a couple of things to realign. We actually rewrote the mission statement to more accurately reflect what we wanted to do, which was to build economic freedom. We started building deep dives into the culture and strategy into onboarding. So even if someone managed to make it through hiring with a misconception about the work that we were doing or how, they wouldn't get very far into their employee journey before having that clarity. We communicated with employees. We told them what we were changing and why we were changing it. And not everyone was super happy with the change, but we created the clarity. We were all better off for knowing exactly what we were doing. We were able to align and we were tracking more closely to the culture that we wanted. So when this happens, and it's probably a when, not an if, as a leader, it is your responsibility to bring the culture back in line. And whether you can manage it with communication or you need to take some action like we did, cultural drift doesn't resolve itself. It'll just get worse and worse and worse. So you intervene to course correct or that culture will become your new culture. All right, in summary, five lessons. Write it down, be flexible, communicate clearly, follow through, and realign when needed. These have emerged over the last five years not because we've always gotten these right. Sometimes we were getting these wrong or not listening to the lessons that we thought we had already learned. And we figured out in retrospect what we should have done differently. So I'm gonna share a couple of examples of where we've stumbled with some of these lessons. So when we didn't write it down, uh, about a year into remote work, one of the biggest pain points for employees was meeting overload. Everyone's calendars were just constantly jammed with meetings. And worse, we had developed this like West Coast centralized scheduling habit. So all the meetings were happening, you know, 9 a.m. PT to 6 p.m. PT, which was absolutely miserable for anyone on the East Coast or anywhere else in the world. And it was only then, a year in, that we realized we should probably write down some meeting norms as a remote first company. And we did, and they helped but it was definitely slower going, slower progress, a slower adjustment to those ways of working than it would have been if the month or the year we went remote, we had said to ourselves, hey, we should probably write down some meeting norms so people know how to schedule meetings and how to have meetings in the most productive way. When we weren't flexible enough, so last summer, 2022, lots of big industry change, uh, at Coinbase, this meant taking a look at our expenses, seeing how we were deploying our resources most effectively, and we ended up cutting our offsite budget in half for the remainder of the year. And as a remote first company, we really believe in the importance of getting together in person periodically. It's super, super important. So when our budget got cut in half, our priority, this is my team, my team's priority was how do we get the most number of people to offsites, no matter what, this year? And that meant creating like a pretty rigid program where we standardized everything, we were trying to find economies of scale, and like the hotels weren't that nice, and the dates weren't that flexible, because we really were focused on getting everyone to these offsites. And it didn't work. It wasn't right for our culture. It wasn't flexible enough for us. It was okay for some teams, but it really wasn't okay for others. And so lesson learned for us this year when we designed our offsite strategy, we designed it to be more flexible. And that might mean fewer people end up at offsites this year, but the overall experience is gonna be better. So when we didn't communicate clearly at Coinbase, um, we're all about pithiness. We love a brief statement. We love a brief email, Slack, like fewer words, the better. Um, and that's sort of the principle that we adopted when we wrote our first culture doc. And as a result, some of the language that we used was misinterpreted. 
So we have a tenet of clear communication, but taken to its extreme, clear communication can look like bluntness, it can look like being demanding, it can look like being rude even. And so what we found was we had, we had been clear in our own minds about what we meant when we said clear communication, but what we really needed was to unpack those ideas and add a lot more concrete advice, concrete examples for employees so that they knew when we said clear communication, what we actually meant was don't say the same thing twice in an email, not make unreasonable demands of your colleagues. So, um, while we've learned most of these lessons and made some of these mistakes as a mostly remote company, these are applicable whether you're hybrid, whether you're entirely in person, whether you are remote, and I have now spent a bunch of time on theory, so I'm gonna end with some actionable tips and a plan. So a couple of things to keep in mind as you start to think about this work for yourself and your team. Avoid culture by committee. So this is the, I was saying this last night, this is the path to blah. This is a way to please everyone and be entirely indistinct in who you are as an organization. Culture should be distinct, even shocking, to borrow a Ben Horowitz term, and it won't be for everyone, and that's okay. I encourage you to be brave with the choices you make for your culture. I just kind of got at this, but beware weaponization of your culture. People are gonna throw your high-level language back at you, like, I'm just trying to be clear with my communications. So don't be afraid to push back and say, that's actually not what we mean when we say clear communications. Don't be afraid to push back and clarify what you do and don't mean by all of this stuff. Avoid framework overload. And I, this, is, this is blasphemy from someone who has been doing this work for like 10 years, but avoid too many frameworks. Don't worry about values and behaviors and cultural tenets and a mission and a vision. Just start somewhere. Pick, pick something and start somewhere. Start clarifying your thinking. Get one framework really, really clear for yourselves. You can worry about filling in the rest of it later. And just get started. So even if you're just writing an anti-doc where all you're doing is capturing your cultural grievances from past companies you've worked at that you never want to be true of your own, just start there. And then you can work your way into what you do want your culture to be. So to help with that last one around just getting started, I'm gonna give you like a little mini plan that you can copy to launch your own culture work. So none of the following items should take you more than an hour. And if you can get this all done in a month, you will have gotten a major head start on this work and set yourself up for success in the long term with respect to your culture. So four steps. Get data. So host an open conversation over lunch about what makes your culture today distinct from places people have worked in the past. This could be with your whole team, this could be with your co-founder, this could be with some advisors, some people who are close to the organization, and it'll also tell you where some initial ideas you might have about what you want your culture to be are already true and where they might be aspirational. Capture your thoughts. So that's the just get started piece. Sit down, maybe work with two or three people max, but bullet out what you want your culture to be. What is the language? What is the lore? What are the rituals that you want for your culture? How do you want it to feel to work at your company? And the stronger the choice, the better. Identify which of those things you have now just written down are aspirational and which are true today. You probably have a gut sense of this, but good to get second and third opinions from other people on your team, um, you can have an open conversation with people, understand, with the intention of like stack ranking, which of these things you're already doing today and which will take a little bit more focused effort from you. And then finally, this gets back to the sort of weaponization of culture, people throwing language in your face. Get specific. Identify three to five concrete behaviors you want to see for each of those bullets you've now written about your culture. So when you say efficient execution, does that mean we ship things at 80%? Does that mean we don't care about proofreading? Does that mean no project should take longer than three weeks? From here, you can do more pressure testing, you can start introducing these ideas to your team, and build them into the systems of your company. The important thing here, as I've now said probably a dozen times, is just getting started. It's not about worrying that you're gonna get things right. And we're still doing this at Coinbase. We're still experimenting with things around how to make people maximally productive, how to do async work the best, how to connect in person in a way that's effective for a remote first company. And I will not tell you how many Google Docs I have socked away, noodling about Coinbase culture, but I will tell you that this is a journey you're gonna be on for the life of your company, and that starting early pays off. It'll give you a culture that's clear, that's distinct, that gets and keeps the right people with you. 
So I hope you will experiment with a couple of the things that we've talked about today and reach out to me and let me know. And uh, I think that's it. So thank you so much for your time. And we'll move to Q&A shortly. Thanks. Uh, I lead people at Uniswap Labs. Before we sort of get into the Q&A, I will share a little context on my background so you all know what pointed questions to ask me. So while I talk, I'm going to share some images from our Uniswap culture workshop we did at our onsite in January, just so you have something kind of pretty going while I tell you my story. Um, so let's see, I joined Uniswap last summer after spending five years at Coinbase, four of those with Daisy. Um, I guess my sort of quick two minute elevator story is I was recruited out of my MFA sculpture program to work at a quant hedge fund, which is a separate story we can talk about later. Um, but I got really excited about the intersection of people and tech at the quant hedge fund, which was called DE Shaw. But I wasn't that passionate at the end of the day about minting money for wealthy people. So that's when I pivoted over to tech and fintech. I spent a couple years at Venmo as the right hand to their CHRO and got them from around probably 40 to 150 and then helped with the PayPal Venmo integration. Then I decided I wanted to go really early stage uh, and kind of build all the things myself. So I went to a little tiny early stage fintech startup called Bond Street where it was 10 people. I was leading the people function and sort of, you know, growing the people as we went. And we got actually probably close to where Uniswap is today. Um, and we're really struggling to raise our Series B. And that was when Coinbase and a couple of other acquirers started sniffing around to potentially acquire Bond Street. So Coinbase didn't acquire Bond Street, but they did acquire me. So I joined <laughs> Coinbase uh, when it was around 100 employees back in 2017. And we effectively 50 x from there. Uh, and then Coinbase now has sort of settled back down to, I think, a headcount of around 3,500. Mm, but in my time there, I was the third HR hire. I sort of built and ran their HR business partner team. I built some sort of core parts of their M&A integration function. And then most recently was leading um, executive comp. In sort of my journey at Uniswap so far, I think I sort of joined at the perfect time because so many of our kind of people and culture building blocks, very germane to what Daisy was talking about, have not yet been built. So we're really using our culture doc or our culture code as like the armature or the operating system on which to build all of the other critical pieces of sort of people and culture infrastructure as we grow. So that's kind of where we are in our journey. And uh, yeah, I think we can turn it over for Q&A. We've heard there's going to be a lot, so you guys got to deliver. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Hi, thanks for the talk. So I've got a question. Um, in the beginning, when you're a small startup, you know, documenting culture, it's kind of a, like a top-down process. But as you add employees and you grow and you evolve, how do you get feedback and then make decisions about how your, your culture might be shifting and more inclusive of the, the whole population? Yeah, I think there's a I think there's probably a a sweet spot there because I think when you're when we were 500 people doing this, it was like messy. It was, you know, we started top down and then we got some bottom up input. I think the way that we did it that that was actually successful was we had the exec team choose a couple of delegates each. So we had each exec team member pick a couple of sort of culture keepers that they saw in the organization to come give feedback. We knew that if we gave sort of decision rights over the culture doc to 500 people, it was gonna be a true mess. So what we ended up doing was picking that sort of tight, tight group of folks who were trusted in the organization, and it was kind of a top-down, bottom-up hybrid because we were intentionally picking the people that were rising stars or heirs apparent to these senior leadership roles, not necessarily senior, senior themselves, but high potential folks and saying like, ah, Jesse Pollock is someone who we think could be an important cultural force in the future of Coinbase, let's get him into the conversation. So I think you can be a little bit choosy about who you bring in, and it's gonna depend on the size. If you're only a 50-person company, you probably can have a full team conversation about the culture you wanna have and figure out where the hotspots are, where your, where your teams have passion. When you're 
an order of magnitude bigger, you probably need to be a little bit more choosy on how you do that. Would you, I don't know, what would you add? Yeah, this has actually been sort of a really fun journey in my time at Uniswap. So I came to Uniswap sort of with my, you know, Coinbase operating system still in place. And Coinbase is like a very more top-down kind of structure than Uniswap and very like efficient execution by nature. So I came in and I was like, okay, great. Priority, let's make a culture doc. And I sort of started to do it, you know, in the Coinbase way, where it was like me and the rest of the leadership team kind of like writing it down and putting it out there. And then it was actually a conversation with the COO, MC, who I think spoke to you all uh, a couple weeks ago. And like, we took a beat and said, oh wait, like, you know, how would we build this if it was based on the sort of like values of Uniswap, which is, you know, structured around essentially the values of Ethereum, right? Like open, decentralized. So the result was, you know, some of the images you saw on the slide a couple slides back, it was like, we did like a full 100 person team workshop where we like broke the team into different groups and sort of really dug deep on like, okay, what's aspirational in terms of our culture? Like, what do we want to see more of? What do we want to see less of? And started the kind of like co-created journey of our culture doc. And that felt much more natural to us and was like a really valuable learning moment for me in my like Coinbase Uniswap integration. Great, thank you. Hi, this is Ning Long from Blockus. Um, I have two questions. Um, so the first one is you mentioned that Brian himself is an introvert and then he's create more like introvert friendly working environment. I wonder, were there any concrete examples about that, how that would be more uh, introvert friendly? And also do you see the difference between do you attract more introverts in different functions? Um, yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah, and maybe I zipped through these really quickly when I was giving, giving the talk, but I think one example is written feedback, like feedback in documents instead of through conversation. So we are a culture, we're very much a culture of documentation. And so even like decision making will be captured in, we have a couple of decision making frameworks, sort of templates that we use, including one called a rapid. So we will actually present a problem in a documented format and then tag in all of the people who need to weigh in on that problem and invite them to share their feedback. And that is how we both make and document a decision. And I think that that's more introvert friendly because you know maybe introverts don't feel as comfortable or as willing to sort of speak up and raise their hand and share a strong opinion in a live meeting, but they might feel much more comfortable doing so at the in, in the comfort of their own desk. So I think that's one example of how we've done it. And then, yeah, and, and in terms of whether we attract more introverts, it's a great question. I think it's probably a balance. I think we probably attract more introverts than if we had a super extroverted culture, but I don't know that it feels wildly imbalanced. I don't think we're like a 90% introverted company. I think the reality is, um, and you know, this, like, there's been a lot of writing on this, but like a lot of the, the, the value of being an introvert, a lot of what introverts tend to bring to the table can be really meaningful and valuable for extroverts too. And so I think it benefits pretty much, I mean, having a culture where interrupting each other is not acceptable in meetings is like that benefits everybody, not just introverts. So I think those are a couple examples. I don't know if you'd had any, any other, you were a little close to hiring, so a little closer to yeah. hiring than I was, so. I think I would probably say one thing that I always thought was really cool about sort of Brian's approach is his self-awareness. Like he was like so um, open about the fact that he was an introvert and that a lot of our like ways of working were structured around that sort of default mode of his that I think it also in our like various eras of building the leadership team made him very self-aware about like what maybe he needed more of and what he wanted to dial up in the leadership hires we made along the way. So his kind of like calling out and structuring the company in that way also enabled us to build, I would say, like a stronger and more diverse leadership team where I would say Emily, for example, like really balances Brian's introvert qualities quite well. Got it, and then thank you. The second question is related to remote working. Um, so what made you decide to go like fully remote and do you see any productivity shift um, at that, that size of the com company? Yeah, I think, well, your second question first, I think it's such an interesting question, and I honestly don't think that anyone has cracked measurement of productivity across an enterprise. It's something that everyone's trying to figure out. I think a lot of people are making wild claims about it. I haven't seen any substantiation that people that, like, across an entire company, across every function, generally speaking, people are more or less productive when they're remote. So I think that's kind of, like, 
a golden goose for someone to go figure out how to solve? Because I think you can say, like, is the, is the eng team doing more eng work? Are the recruiting team doing more hiring? But it's hard to say, like, over and above, you know, like, functional lines, is everyone more productive or not? I think what we, what we believe is that people are not less productive, and I think what remote offers is more flexibility and an ability to tap into hiring pools that we wouldn't have access to if we only had offices where we ever had offices, which was San Francisco, Portland, Chicago, and New York in the US. We can hire people in Miami that don't want to leave Miami. Um, so I would say that, and your, sorry, your first question was, Oh, what made you want to go oh, fully remote? What made you just want to go remote? Yeah, I mean, I think that was part of it was experiencing a lack of productivity drop in the beginning of the pandemic. So we found that we could be as productive, or you know, the sort of the felt perception was we were as productive remote as we were in person, and we wanted to, in some ways, embrace the principles of crypto in terms of decentralization. In terms of you know, we we often we say we don't have a headquarters now. We are a decentralized company, and that means we should be able to hire anywhere. And we believe that you know, talent is not is. Uh, Talent is equally distributed across the world. And so we don't want to hire only the people who want to move to San Francisco, New York, Chicago, Portland, wherever we might have offices. And this enables us to do that. Got it. Thank you. Thanks. I guess I would say Uniswap, by comparison, is more of a hybrid model. So we do have an HQ in New York, and about half the team is there. Uh, and then the rest are distributed. So I find we're sort of like really thoughtful about what we try to get done where. Like, okay, if I'm in New York for two weeks, then you know I'll do a lot of like high collaborative, interactive work and try to get all of that done in that period of time. Whereas if I have a lot of like focused project work, that's more what I do when I'm remote. But obviously you can't you can always do that, but I think that's kind of the way the way we're structuring it. This has been super timely because we're planning our first offsite. So I'm trying to figure out like what actually goes into constructing an effective offsite. What percent is just play versus actually getting work done? Like I saw your pictures, beautiful pictures. <laughs> like I'm trying to figure out I like the balance. I, I use ChatGPT to make an outline <laughs> for our <laughs> offsite, right? So I'm trying to help fill up the gaps and figure out what to do. Do you have any tips on that? So many tips. Right. Uh, <laughs> well, we should definitely like come find me afterwards. I'd like <laughs> love to dig in with you. I mean, what do you want to what do you want to get out of the offsite? What's your objective? We have a couple milestones that we want to hit. Um, so getting the team aligned on that and um, getting everybody like equipped with our culture, what we're doing, our background, getting to know each other as people, you know, beyond keyboards, I think is like a great start. But I'm trying to think like if there's any like activities that we do, like I saw your pictures again, like, you know, like <laughs> more of those things. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think that it, it sounds like you've got a bit of a spectrum of things you want to achieve, but that alignment maybe is a big one of those. Right. And so I think bringing people together in activities where they're sort of maybe experiencing that alignment before they necessarily feel it. So like, you know, like dumb team building activities have existed for decades for a reason. So like find the least cringe one that you want to engage in and, and sort of poke around with that. Um, but yeah, let's, let's brainstorm afterwards. I don't okay. know, you have, do you have initial thoughts? Yeah, I would strongly plus one the sort of like be clear up front with the rest of your team on sort of like what you're solving for, like what you're trying to get out of the offsite. And I think general rule of thumb is like a good mix of types of ways of showing up for the team is really helpful. Like if there's something really important you want to educate them on, great. You know, there's some version of the, some form of the offsite where you're talking at them, but then follow that immediately, right, with something more interactive where they're learning about one another. They're kind of like getting more reps with each other and like building trust and community as you go. I think I could probably even, if you want to see like the sort of like rough outline for our last Uniswap offsite, happy to share that. That'd be great. And then yeah. my last question is, because we're working remote, something that we do every single morning is like in our uh, daily stand-up channel on Slack, we kind of like talk about what we did yesterday, what we plan to do today, what our blockers are. It's sort of like a framework we've put in place to kind of keep everybody on the same page on what everybody's executing on. Curious, is there anything like that in addition that we could maybe include? Is that a good idea to do? Anything else that comes to mind that you've seen from your experience working remote? Yeah, I love that. I think, yeah, I think that kind of daily ritual is like, is super powerful and I think it keeps people, it does keep people aligned. And it sounds like you're also doing periodic in-person connection, which I, yeah. as you've heard me say, I think is super, super important. Um, yeah, I mean, I think some of what I talked about in terms of, and you know, Key just alluded to this with respect to offsites, 
But clarity of intention, clarity of objective is super important, and I think it's easy for people in a remote environment to sort of get down into their respective rabbit holes and like focus very sort of nearsightedly on like the tasks that are in front of them. So as a founder, part of a founding team, part of what I think you can do is help them pull up out of the weeds occasionally, and maybe this is weekly, maybe this is monthly, but where, where and how do you wanna reinforce some of those fundamental, some of those fundamental milestones that maybe you just mentioned you're going to talk about in your offsite, or some of those goals that you have that you're focused on, or even like the mission, the sort of ultimate, you know, achievement that you're looking for as as a company. I think that you, hopefully, are the, are the person who has sort of the bandwidth and the brain space to do that as the at the at the company. So I would just think about how you want to bring that, and that could be a similar, you know, like Slack-based ritual. That could be like a little micro all hands that you have, or virtual happy hour, you know, forced fun, everyone's favorite. Cool, um, okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah, bring that in. I'd be curious if you could share some of the tips on how to like, like really use culture as a, as a productivity and performance tool and whether even like the concept of people culture is actually at this early stage maybe takes away from that and it's more so like a hidden context of all of the practice or some of the practices that you described and. Um, I'm just, I guess I'm worried about like being navel gazing into culture so early on when actually all that matters is performance. Yeah, I mean, I think that, I think the simple truth is that you, your company already has a culture. You already have one. And the question is just how intentional do you want to be about it? And how clear do you want to be about it? And like, yeah, like we were, someone asked a question about this yesterday, but you could, you could choose not to engage with this work. Like not doing this work is not going to stop you from getting stuff done. But I think that it's an investment that you're making early on, even if you're not, even if it's not about changing anything now, even if it's just about capturing that performance-based culture that you are already cultivating inside your org, then I think that is equally valuable as outlining the sort of like this big aspirations that you would need to put dozens of hours of work into with your entire team to achieve. So I think, you know, you're going to, you're, you will, you do, you will have a culture. And so I think navel, navel gazing, like, yes, I think in the same way that like, outlining a product strategy is sort of like, you could just, you could just run, right, without, without putting things down on paper, but clarifying that will clarify your thinking, will clarify your action, and I think, um, I would also encourage you to think about the connection between this work and the way you measure success. So if you have someone on your team who achieves all of their goals, but is an asshole in the process, like, is that okay with you? It could, it could be, that's a choice you could make, but, Clarifying that for everyone in the company is more helpful than just letting that one asshole be that one asshole and everyone else be upset about it, if that makes sense. And in the transition that Coinbase did at the time when it said like business first, none of the like social stuff. Yeah. Uh, what, what are the, some of the lessons from there? So many lessons. Um, yeah, I think that this kind of comes back to a couple of things that I mentioned in my talk. One is around... Um, creating a culture of transparency for the good moments and the hard moments. I think that, I don't think we 100% nailed the change management around that decision. Mm -hmm. I think we probably could have done it better. But I will say that I think ultimately that decision was aligned with the culture that Brian wanted to cultivate. And he knew it was going to be an unpopular decision. He knew that it was going to be an unpopular move and decided that on balance it was better to be clear than to allow the kind of friction in the company that he, he and many of us were experiencing at that time. And so I guess, you know, I, I said earlier, you know, be brave about your choices around culture. And I, I would just underscore that. I think that know that you're not going to please all the people all the time, but that's one, I think, of the reasons you want to do this work sooner rather than later is you can, ca you know, today, a message like that at a company of 10 people might lose one person. If you wait until you're 500 people to do that, you might lose 50 people, 100 people. And so getting that clarity early will make sure you've got the right people in the mix who are aligned with that culture, who want to be part of that culture actively. So I don't know, what would you, do, would you add anything to that? Um, you, were, you were here for this chapter of Coinbase. I was, yeah. I was leading our HR business partner team when Brian sort of made that mission first decision. And I, to be honest, was a big disagree and commit on that decision. Um, in that, I think I was thinking about it through the lens of if it were like key.com and I was running Coinbase, that maybe isn't the culture that I would have built. Mm -hmm. However, over the subsequent years, I actually sort of 
was humbled in some ways, and I think I learned a lot from that decision of Brian's in that he was successful in like transparently executing on the culture that he wanted to build. So while it maybe isn't the decision I would make, it was like one of probably the most valuable like learning experiences of my career, sort of seeing him do that and then like, you know, demonstrate that it did actually work. To your first question around performance, I think, you know, as you're articulating your values and your own kind of culture code, I think it's useful to Daisy's earlier talk to just make it as simple as possible, but if you sort of make it simple and authentic and clear, and then even use those principles or those values to tell the team how you're thinking about performance and how you're measuring performance, I think they will appreciate that clarity. And like the more you can kind of, you know, use your culture as like the through line for everything you're building from a people perspective, like that will resonate with your team because it will feel true. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, and just to add to that, I would say like the culture shouldn't feel extra on top of other stuff you're doing. It should feel co completely aligned with it. So if, if part of your, if one of the pieces of your culture code is efficient execution, then you should be rewarding people for really good efficient execution and you should be giving them constructive feedback if they are not executing efficiently. So it should feel like, that, I guess, and maybe that's part of what you mean when you say authentic. Like it should mm -hmm. be consistent across the way that you operate and then it won't feel, and then it'll be an accelerator to the work that you do and not um, a decelerator to you know, the, the speed that you're trying to operate with. Uh, I'm, I'm curious, speaking of uh, unique cultures, what are some distinct cultural traditions at Coinbase and Uniswap? Mm. One of my favorite uh, traditions, which I, I will admit has sort of fallen off, but it was something that we used to do that I really, really loved, um, was a weekly series at which, uh, which was called Coinbase Matters. I think, I think this was inspired by a similar series, I think at Columbia that they do, where any Coinbase employee would just get up and talk in like a little conference room and just talk about any topic they were passionate about for like 10, 20 minutes. I think I gave a presentation on Nicolas Cage once, um, I think I, I can't even remember. I've been tested. I'm sure I gave one on hot dogs at some point. Like, <laughs> but it was like every. But like people were really intensely vulnerable. People talked about like their adoption stories. People talked about like family histories. People talked about hot dogs and Nicolas Cage. And it was this moment where, especially across functional lines, which maybe you don't, uh, you know, as someone on the people team, I don't often work really closely with like line level engineers. Um, getting to know those people on like an intensely personal level, like within a half an hour was a really am amazing experience. I think we've now recently implemented a, something that kind of echoes this, which is um, monthly sort of virtual social contests at Coinbase. So Brian kicked this off last year with a so, uh, virtual um, contest around our social battle stations Slack channel. So everyone took pictures of their work set up at home. And I think like the best one as voted by emojis got one ETH. And we just did another contest around a health and fitness challenge, which was like amazing. You know, people, people who were like, posting about their meditation practices or training for a marathon or like skydiving. It was just a way that we've sort of like hacked the uh, isolation of remote first and like found a way for people to become really vulnerable and intimate in like a very quick way. So I'm really liking that these days. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think at some point I maybe did a presentation on uh, bending neon sculpture, which I do in my sort of side life. And I think, it, yeah, at some point, maybe we screened my stop motion short, which was really fun. Um, at Uniswap, like one of, I would say, our unstated values in putting people first is kind of like around creating whimsy and like being a little bit like absurd. Uh, so early days, uh, Hayden and team, they like started something they called White Claw Wednesdays and they would only drink pink White Claws because pink unicorns, obviously. And that has evolved into Wednesdays, like people concocting creative pink, often disgusting drinks that everyone drinks together. Um, and then like on the opposite end of the spectrum, Hayden himself is a little bit of an introvert and uh, like sort of likes quiet collaborative work. So we got like one of those giant like five by five foot puzzles that is of the unicorn tapestry at the cloisters in New York. And like the team, I think it's on Thursdays, we'll just like get together and like do a puzzle. And then once we were finished with the puzzle, Hayden took everyone to the cloisters to like 
uh, have drinks and celebrate. So it's like things across the whole spectrum that kind of just like embody things that are authentic to us. That sounds fantastic. Thank you. Hi, I'm Michael. I actually was at Coinbase until basically this program. So I uh, went through the transition to remote, which I thought actually was was great. So thank you both for your for your yeah. Tell us, tell me what I, yeah. What did we get wrong? <laughs> yeah, tell the real story. No, it, it was actually it was um, it was authentically organic. I'll put it that mm -hmm. way. It was like you know it wasn't 100 percent smooth, but felt felt good, and and you were you know you felt like you were part of the part of the growth of the company, which was which was great. Um, but yeah, so while I was there, I had the opportunity to work with a few different teams, and one thing I noticed was the culture between like um, the consumer side uh, or the retail side and the institutional side was very different. Mm. Um, so like, how do you think about subcultures? Mm. Um, and you know, like, do you think about it in terms of like Dunbar's number for tribes, or there's like some natural separations in product teams, um, you know, as smaller numbers or bigger numbers? Yeah, like, how do you think of that? Gosh, that's such an interesting question, and I think it's it is it is a natural consequence at some point of scale. Um, I do strongly believe that subcultures should be, you know, uh, at least cousins, if not sisters, to one another. I think like any further than that, and you start to actually fracture the way that you work, and it starts to be really challenging to work across functions when you have these sort of radically different values and cultures, you know, between like finance and insto. Um, and so, yeah, I think part of it part of it is influenced by the personality of the team lead. So it's sort of like the mini founder effect, right? Like if the founder has a significant impact on the culture of the company, the leader of a team is going to have sort of like a next order down sort of version of that influence. Um, and part of that, I think, is it's on us as a people team and as a, a, a people leadership team to ensure that we are doing enough sort of cultural um, mind melding with all of those leaders, so with all of the leaders of all of the product functions, that there is a critical mass of consistency, and like there's always gonna be a little bit of difference. There's you know, like different personalities, you know, we have introverts, extroverts, people who've been in a long time at the company, people who've just joined, people who come from TradFi, people who come from tech, like all of that is gonna influence the subculture. But I think that this to me is an indication of like the importance of like leadership development and like leadership training at these companies where when you have these little micro orgs, and in some cases not so micro, um, they need to have some level of consistency with the sort of enterprise culture. Otherwise, you're just running a bunch of companies at once, and I suspect you'll be less efficient for it. What would you What would you say about that? Yeah, I think it maybe is a little bit connected to what we touched on earlier around like understanding like where your team or your leaders sort of spike and where their gaps are. I think the key to it is sort of like you know maximizing the superpowers of the various tribes and like getting them to sort of like you know bring one another up in the areas where they're strong. We didn't always get this right at Coinbase. Early on in my days there, we um, hired a team in Chicago out of TradFi to build this like souped up uh, low latency matching engine that very much resembled uh, the kinds of engines they were building on Wall Street. And I think we built that team so fast and so specifically from this other world that it did very much become a sort of tribe unto itself. And we actually ultimately weren't successful at like integrating it with the rest of the company for that reason. However, you know, like never, you know, let a mistake not be useful, right? So we like learned from what we did wrong there and then applied it to our sort of subsequent builds. I spent a lot of time um, at Coinbase thinking about mergers and acquisitions and like integrating teams when we brought them on board. And that was typically sort of like the key to teams that were successful versus not. Like, were we able to maximize the superpowers of that team and integrate them well versus if you more often than not sort of leave that tribe unto itself, like untended to, those tend not to work as well. Got it, makes sense. And then how, how are things shaping up at Uniswap? Because like you know, with this decentralized approach and it sounds like you're kind of at the size where some of these pockets might be forming, like how are you approaching that? <laughs> yeah, so uh, we just launched our wallet product. As many of you know, that was a long a journey in the making and um, we fought with Apple for quite some time. 
and are very, very pleased that it's out in the world. So I think, yeah, over the course of that build, like we definitely, like, you know, we three X'd in that time period and very much found around the like 60 to 80 person threshold that it was like feeling harder to get stuff done. And like the size of the teams in the pods that we were working on started to feel uh, a little bit unwieldy. And that was around the time um, when I was interviewing with Uniswap and they were contemplating like, huh, okay, the way we are working today isn't like delivering what we would like to accomplish. Maybe we need to sort of restructure or we rethink about the, our ways of working from a product engineering and design perspective. So we sort of like shuffled the teams around, which created some short-term noise, but enabled us now to ship much faster. And we've also started, I think, to the previous question, to like create more um, specific ways of communicating and collaborating to Daisy's point around like, okay, wait, we need to write it down. We need to sort of like explicitly uh, perform and embody the, the behaviors that we think will lead us to become ultimately successful. So we're getting like a little bit more crisp, like not corporate, of course, Hayden would never let us do that. Um, but I think a little more formalized in the way, the ways we work together. Got it, thanks. I'm gonna jump in here with a question. <laughs> um, one that came up a lot at Coinbase and I'm sure comes up with all companies no matter what the size, is just sort of the Slack culture. Mm. You know, whether it's Slack or Teams or whatever you may use. Um, you know, when is the right time to start kind of encoding, like, I don't know, rules, principles around that? Um, I know at Coinbase it, we probably put it in too late um, and it was really, really tough to do that, but I'm just curious what your guys' thoughts on that. Yeah, another example I think of, you know, um, some real strong opinions across our exec team that I, as at the time, as a head of internal comms, was like deeply uncomfortable with like the decision to lock down a Slack channel because it was too noisy, and I was like, there's gonna be so much backlash. And there was, but ultimately it was the right thing to do. Um, I think that there are sort of layers here. I think there's, um, there is never, it's never too early to think about sort of like good citizenship on Slack, and that's true whether you're a team of two or 20 or 200 or 2,000. It's like, you know, what are, what, how do you want people just to show up? Like, do you have expectations that they're gonna respond within an hour? Do you want people to be at hearing in giant channels and sort of pulling attention away from whatever anyone else is doing? What do you think about having social Slack channels? If you're a remote, if you're a remote company, it probably makes sense. So some of the sort of like baseline ways of showing up on Slack, I think like, Again, another thing that you could probably come up with in an hour if you wanted to sit down and think about it. I think some of the sort of broader principles, like some of the things we've done at Coinbase as we've scaled significantly, so you know, channels on Slack that have thousands of people on them, we've been increasingly liberal about making those channels sort of read only or sort of one to many. And so I would definitely encourage you to think about that and really build ahead of scale. Um, the transition's never gonna be easy, but it'll be easier the sooner you do it. So, so taking a channel, like if you had a Slack channel that was specifically focused on asking the leadership team questions. We had something like this at Slack, or at Coinbase when I joined. Um, and you know, three years later, I think sort of right around the time Kim joined, we had, um, we made the decision to shut that channel down because th we had sort of implicitly created an expectation that any employee could ask any question of any executive in the company and expect an answer on a reasonable timetable. And the exec team doesn't scale with the company. So like, we're now talking about thousands of people asking seven people questions, and it just wasn't practical. And so we had to sort of remake the way that we were thinking about that. That's not gonna be your problem for some time. I mean, it would be great if, it, if you guys got to that stage very, very quickly, but it'll, it'll take a little bit for you to get to the thousands of employees stage. So as hard as it is to think about ahead of time, I would say the sooner you can think about how you want to operate at scale, the better, but it's definitely going to be a balance as you, as you grow and as you think about this stuff. How are you guys thinking about this at Uniswap? Yeah. Seems I like think you have a very vibrant Slack culture. We do have a very vibrant Slack culture. I think I would echo Daisy's point, like sort of scaling your approach to like Slack and communication, sort of commensurate with your growth, growth plan makes a ton of sense. We've been like, a little bit, you know, open, and I would say sort of decentralized in our approach to Slack. Like, we have set principles for how we expect people to show up on Slack, um, but we don't, we haven't like locked down channels as yet. We're not sort of like yet taking any sort of a policing approach, and we're kind of defaulting to trust, hoping that, you know, 
the values and the principles we've set around how people show up for one another and like what it means to put people first will mean that the team will be respectful to one another. So we're hoping that scales. We have recently moved from, in our all hands, we do allow anyone to ask questions, but to submit them in advance. They used to be anonymous, and we found that wasn't really cultivating the ownership mindset we wanted. So now they're attributed to the person, and we actually, if the person wants to, we encourage them to ask the question live, so they can kind of like own the inquiry with us, and it's more of a discussion. But we're still tiny, so it's easy. Great, well thank you so much, uh, Daisy and Key, that was great. Thanks guys, thank you.